building on material and content provided to us by Joe McBride. He's a professor emeritus at UC Berkeley, and it's presented today by Logan Steinharder, who is a community planting manager here at FUS, and Alex Javier, who is the education program manager. Um, they are going to take it from here. And before we get rolling, I will say that if you have any questions or technology issues, anything like that, please put it in the chat. I'm going to be moderating that. And we are also recording today. And so if you have any problems with that, um, we've turned your video off so that you have security and privacy on that amount. But please let us know if you would rather have any of your information omitted from this recording. Um, with that, I think we can go ahead and get started. I'll pass it off to Alex. All right. Uh, thanks, Anna. Um, and yeah, it is very nice to see a lot of familiar faces. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Chat if that's a problem. Um, and yeah, special shout out and thanks to Joe McBride, one of my professors at UC Berkeley, both in landscape architecture and um, wildland forestry, uh, who gives this presentation on a yearly basis to our community forester class. So if you've been in that class for the last couple of years, it could be a little bit of review, um, but still a good refresher and exploration of our city. Um, so on the next slide, we will look at our outline real quick. Um, today we're going to talk about um, the different waves and historical developments of San Francisco's urban forest, looking at the people um, and cultures that influence those waves. We'll also talk a little bit about our current and past policies um, and how that has played into the ecology um, and species diversity that you see today. So on our next slide, we would like to start at the beginning um, and honor and acknowledge the uh, traditional peoples of this landscape, the Ohlone. Um, even though the San Francisco we see now is a small blip in the history of the whole landscape, these were the original tenders and caretakers of our land. Um, as it stands right now, the Ohlone people are still here, still fighting for recognition um, and still uh, being stewards and caring for their traditional landscape. The Ohlone were not one group of people, um, but several different groups spread out around the peninsula, South Bay, typically from my understanding, um, the Bay Area south of um, the Delta and through the peninsula. On the other side, you would have had different groups of people. Um, but the landscape and the traditional ecosystems that uh, we still see are the result of their hard work um, and care. And as in many other parts of California, some of the rarest landscapes, plants and plant communities were those that were most heavily tended um, by these people. So uh, with their displacement um, and the fact that they're still not federally recognized as a tribe, um, th some of those ecosystems are in jeopardy. So we want to start at the beginning, recognize that the Ohlone people are still here um, and talk a little bit about the landscape that they would have created for their um, several thousands of years of tenure prior to the Spanish colonialization and uh, genocide. So let's look at the historical San Francisco as it once was in our next slide. Um, so you can see here, we have a map of San Francisco zooming in on what you would have seen um, probably about 500 years ago, uh, much of the western part of the city was dunescape um, and all that is sediment that's coming out of the Golden Gate and Delta because the Golden Gate drains about 60% of the water and watershed in California, the whole inner ring of the Sierra Nevada. So all that sediment and silt would move down, flow around the corner of the Golden Gate and then begin to move upwards towards the spine of the mountain range um, that was caused by many fault lines. Um, and so at the coast, you would have those big dune swaths um, moving to more stable plant communities as you reach the fault line zone and the end of the Santa Cruz mountain range um, with Mount Sutro, Mount Davidson, etc. cetera. Um, in that mix, you also have some really rare uh, and challenging soil conditions, um, partly because of the serpentine um, that is from the fault line and full of heavy metals and also chert and other rocks. Um, so depending upon the soil and the uh, 
natural conditions, the wind, the salt, the fog, you would have had some varying different types of coastal scrub or dune or grassland communities. Um, on the eastern side of the city, you would have had like the Laguna Dolores, um, other sorts of wetland habitats, um, some salt marshes, and really not a lot of trees aside from a couple ecosystems that we will uh, look at in the next slide. So these are some pictures of what you could imagine walking through those different San Francisco ecosystems are. As we said, on the west, we had um, the sand dunes and we still find evidence of sand dunes every time we open up a concrete basin in the Richmond or the sunset. Um, and then we also had a lot of grasslands. Um, these coastal grasslands are a combination of both the soil conditions, as well as the traditional land tenure. Um, in uh, many places, both north and south, some of these coastal grasslands, also known as coastal balds, are disappearing because of the lack of fire and um, traditional human management. Uh, so you'll have um, kind of seeding in of trees that normally wouldn't have been able to survive fires, um, or shrubs that wouldn't have been able to survive fires. So traditionally we would have seen a lot more grasslands in San Francisco than you do now. Um, as you move to a little more uh, fertile habitat or a little less um, disturbance, you end up with some coastal scrubs. Um, this is characteristic of not just the San Francisco Peninsula, but also the entire California floristic province, um, all the way from the Oregon border down through Baja, California. And this is one of the most diverse and endemic ecosystems in California, both the coastal scrub, the coastal chaparral. Um, and you can see an example of what that would have looked like every time you look over the Marin headlands. You can see that kind of grayish, small, scrubby stuff. So if you can imagine looking over the headlands, aside from like Muir Woods and some of those Douglas fir forests, that is what a lot of San Francisco would have looked like. Um, along the waterways, you would have had riparian woodlands, um, places where there was some silt, some sediment, some deeper uh, soils and access to water. And that is where you would have seen the majority of the tree species that were endemic and that we will talk about. Um, in the east side, we've had some salt marshes. Trees don't really like salt, so you wouldn't have seen many trees there, but it is a very unique and also at-risk habitat because we like to develop on those nice salt marshes and flats. So a lot of that habitat is also at risk of development or has already been destroyed. Um, the only native stand of trees that we have in San Francisco that is fully remnant is the oak woodland that you see on the corner of like Fulton and Stanyon at Golden Gate Park. So there would have been more oak woodlands, particularly in some of the eastern parts of the city and the more protected zones, but that stand of coast live oaks is our main remnant forest that we have left. Uh, other places have been restored like Glen Canyon um, or the Presidio, but the, the thing that we have that is left over from a long time ago is that oak woodland stand. Um, so I think we have a poll for our next slide. So Anna, please take it away. We sure do have a poll. Uh, this is to kind of test your knowledge and just help you engage with the material. So it is a poll about native trees. And the question is, how many species of trees are native to the San Francisco Peninsula? You can go ahead and submit your answer. Um, it's not a test, it's just to see, you know, what you might expect, what you think, and you're gonna learn about it soon. I'm gonna cut that off after about 10 more seconds. I'm gonna see if we have any questions in the chat. Nope, we're all good. Feel free to submit your questions to the chat. Um, we'll be answering them around the same time that we do these polls. All right, so here are the results of the polls. We have, the, most of people are guessing one to four species of trees, followed by five to 10 species, and then maybe 20% of folks guessed that there were more than 10 species native. Great, so as probably some of our answers, um, the limited range of answers that we provided 
probably indicated there weren't a lot of native trees. Um, the true trees that we would have seen would have been um, species like Arroyo Willow, um, California Bay, California Buckeye, Coast Live Oak, Blue Elderberry, and Red Alder, with Arroyo Willow, Red Alder um, being exclusively riparian species. Um, California Bay, Coast Live Oak, um, and Buckeye being more um, mixed and kind of in maybe rocky areas with some seeps. Um, blue elderberry being a little more of a coastal species. Um, the one plant I would like to highlight here is the California buckeye. Um, as we know, San Francisco and California have a um, Mediterranean climate where it rains a lot in the winter and then it's dry for a really long time. So many of us think of deciduous species, trees that lose their leaves, um, as trees that lose their leaves in the winter. But actually, California buckeye is adapted to our special conditions, and they are what they call drought deciduous. So they leaf out in late December, early January, right after um, the solstice, and then they drop their leaves usually by July, depending upon what the water year was like. So that's a really cool example of a weird tree that we would see here. Um, the next slide is going to talk about a couple other things that are typically shrubs aside from special conditions. Um, these are all trees, the holly leaf cherry, the Pacific wax myrtle, and the toyon um, are ones that if they are in exposed open areas or windy places will be a wide spreading shrub. Um, but if they are either protected from the wind or grown in a forest in shade, they will end up having a tree-like structure. So the Pacific Wax Myrtle, even though you think of it as a short, flat thing, the California Big Tree Record has a diameter of over 20 inches, which is pretty incredible. Um, and I have seen toyons in the Santa Cruz Mountains grown in shade that are just perfect straight trees instead of wide shrubs. So. The only trees that are native that are on the approved street trees list, on the experimental list, are toyon and holly leaf cherry. All the other native true trees are either too big or spreading, so they cause sidewalk damage. Um, so ones that we can plant that are native right now are holly leaf cherry, toyon, and maybe someday blue elderberry. The next slide are some big shrubs. So these were all native to San Francisco or the peninsula, um, but they don't typically get very large aside from special conditions. So the California lilac, um, the manzanita, and the coast silk tassel can all get about 20 feet tall, usually have multiple stems, but we do plant a form of California lilac as a small street tree. The one thing about that species though is they are extremely fire dependent, so they don't tend to live very long because they would have grown in a place that burned about every 10 to 20 years. So on the next slide, we that is a recap of the tree species that we would have had during the Ohlone period from about 16, I guess 1700 earlier. Everything else, all the other trees that we're going to talk about today were added later on. So that is the first period of our California or San Francisco urban forest. So moving on to the Spanish and Mexican period uh, around late 1600s to the mid 1700s, uh, Spanish were beginning to make their way up California. As I tell the green teens, um, Imagine you're walking through all this brush, all this scrub, it's really hot, there's poison oak, there's all sorts of things, and then all of a sudden you get to the Bay Area and it's huge and it's awesome and it's protected and that they kind of stopped there. They didn't really go much farther north. Um, so uh, at, that, at that time, about 1776 is when the Mission Dolores and also the Presidio were established, bringing with them a different set of land management regimes, um, a genocide of the indigenous people, and a couple of different tree species. So in the next slide, we will look at, we have, we had two settlements. We had the um, military settlement of the Navy, the Presidio, and then we also had the mission. The, the Presidio was placed in a strategic location to protect the port from any sort of uh, foreign invasions 
and the mission was in a nice good site close to the big lagoon of Dolores where it's nice protected and warm so they could actually try to establish some agriculture. So the next slide will show us some dioramas and rend renditions of the mission. Um, so the first one is an artist rendition. The second, the second photograph to the right of that is a drawing um, from 1816 showing the really subjugation of the indigenous people. 1842 shows the mission just after the um, Mexican independence. And 1856, that's showing the mission as it stood right after, um, a few years after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, where we actually, um, America, then owned San Francisco. So the next slide is another poll. So Anna, so take it away again. All right, so we're going to start another quick poll um, related to uh, the Spanish um, forestry regime, which is what is your favorite fruit from one of the fruit trees that were grown here? And I couldn't actually put all of the fruits that the Spanish grew. Uh, there were a lot, <laughs> but go ahead and answer. We'll see the tastes of this group. I'll cut it off after about 10 more seconds. And again, if you guys have any questions about the content that Alex is bringing up, feel free to throw it in the chat. All right, we're going to end the poll. Share the results. Looks like we've got a strong preference for figs and peaches. I would have to agree with that. Maybe lemons too. I wasn't allowed to answer, but apparently no one else likes dates. Um, so back to our history of San Francisco, the Spanish were very practical. They didn't really bring anything um, just for ornamental reasons. Uh, they brought trees for either Monterey Cypress for um, an evergreen tree that could be used in the cemeteries or plants that were valuable for food or ceremonial purposes. So things like apples, figs, date palms, coconut palms, so I don't think those lasted very long or did very well. Lemons, limes, olives, oranges, peaches, pears, plums, and pomegranates, all the things that you would have found kind of in Mediterranean orchards or vineyards at the time. So uh, if you like any of these things, and honestly, these are the backbone of a lot of the California orchards that we still have today. Um, the California fan palm was brought over specifically because, as we know, the Spanish has a long history of Catholicism. And so as someone who grew up Catholic, we had to do the um, Palm Sundays and Ash Wednesdays as part of the Lent tradition. So that is why they brought the California fan palm and other palm trees uh, for that purpose. On the next slide, we're gonna look at the Presidio. And we think of the Presidio today as a really dense forest, which was planted um, a lot later um, after the American occupation and ownership um, because trees don't necessarily provide the most defensible ground. So they put the Presidio at the gate and they had it slightly on the high ground. And from these artist renditions, this um, drawing of the site and a photograph, it was really open and windy and they, it was well protected but from what I understand, until they started planting trees there, a lot of the soldiers really did not like it because they were just being battered by the wind all the time. Um, they also kept it separate from the mission because they didn't want the soldiers to mess with the families of um, indigenous people at the uh, mission. So they were separate both for strategic purposes and, and the landscape uses and also for cultural reasons. So the next slide is just the end of the Spanish period. So we have um, the, the mission and the Presidio were established in 1776, a coincidence with our country's founding. Um, then we had 1810 to 1821. It was no longer under Spanish control, but actually was won over to Mexico, the independent country. Um, and that then they began to secularize the mission. So instead of having large land grants related to the 
Roman Catholic Church, they actually became more of um, economic lands. And so that kind of began to division those pro large properties into smaller private properties. Um, 1835, William Richardson was granted permission to establish the town of Yerba Buena, which is that little port you see at the bottom right. And that would have been the beginning of true San Francisco. Um, so kind of near where the financial district and the Embarcadero lay now. Um, we, then we had the Mexican-American War in the eight, late 1840s, ending with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and the um, turnover of the American West and Southwest from Mexican hands to United States hands. So if we look at the population of Yerba Buena, 1835, it was just William Richardson and his wife. By 1840, there are about 50 people, mostly um, doing hide tanning and trading out of that port. 1847, they had a big business for running cattle and um, some of the fruits that they were growing to be shipped throughout the rest of the uh, Mexican West. And then the gold rush happened. And that will be the next period that Logan is talking about. I think I have one or two more slides and I'll turn it over to Logan. So that's just a picture, an artist rendition of what Yerba Buena looked like. Instead of one large land grant, you had some small divisions with a few houses and a bunch of large ships. So for the last slide, we're going to talk about someplace completely different, another SF, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, this is based, this slide is based on the work of J.B. Jackson, A Sense of Place and A Sense of Time, and it really ties into the landscape that we see today. So um, the first images are a picture of Santa Fe, New Mexico, and a drawing of it before the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in the 1840s. At the bottom, you can see the same city um, drawn in 1855 after the Americans began to come in. And so how this ties into San Francisco is that under the Mexican and Spanish periods, this place was colonized by people from Mediterranean climates. They were not, who were not used to or did not have a cultural expectation of big forests and front yards or, or treed parks. They came from a dry, scrubby grassland and if you look at a lot of countries or that are along the Mediterranean and also a lot of cities that were um, Spanish influenced, you typically have buildings right up to the street um, and you don't have many front yard setbacks and you also have wide open plazas with very few trees. Contrast that with um, the British or Northern European or even New England tradition of having large trees in their front yards. Um, and you can see how the different cultural expectations have changed with the waves of people. Um, and this can actually even be tied to changes we see today with the whole challenges of green gentrification, where people who, um, you know, come from the more traditional Mexican background that lived in this city for a long time and multi-generational don't have the same association of street trees or value of street trees because those are more, um, I guess, associated with people from Northern European descent or from the East or Midwest moving in. Some of that is purely coincidental, people just planting trees because they want trees. And as Logan will talk about, some of these parks and things were actually created to attract wealthy New Englanders to come to San Francisco. So that's kind of that transition that we're going to talk about. And in the next slide, we'll look at the fact that even during the Spanish-Mexican period, we probably only had about 20, maybe 25 true tree species. And all the rest of the ones that you see came after the next two eras. So with that, I will stop talking and um, I will pass it on to Logan. Um, and Colleen, your answer will come later to your question. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Alex, for uh, filling in on the history of uh, San Francisco here prior to it being uh, the modern American city we know it uh, as today. Um, this all basically started during the gold rush in uh, 1848 when gold was discovered at Sutter Mill, um, which then led to a massive influx of uh, immigrants to San Francisco, both 
seeking opportunity through gold mining or other ventures. I think from a previous slide, you can note that the population in 1848 was 5,000 and by 1849 was uh, 25,000. So a five-fold increase in a very short period. Um, so what does that mean for trees? Uh, as we can see in the next slide, um, here are some photos of historic SF during this period. Um, again, a period of rapid urbanization here um, and extremely dense housing. And as we can see here from the views of Telegraph Hill, Russian Hill, Filbert and Clay, um, wide open streets with not too many trees. And that's largely because any existing vegetation was cleared uh, to make way to the city that basically grew overnight. Um, but there were still some trees in the area here. So um, this top left uh, picture here is the two oldest uh, still standing houses in San Francisco. Um, plantings was, planting of trees was largely relegated in a Northern European tradition of private gardens or parks. So the photo on the right is uh, one of those private neighborhood parks. And then we can see it uh, progress through time here uh, in the lower photos as more housing comes in. Uh, San Francisco remains the second most densely populated city after New York in America. Um, so many of the, much of the garden still remains. However, uh, the need for housing and urban development um, sort of took precedence over uh, trees. Um, but trees still did exist in other parts of the city prior to the development of parks. Uh, this was most notably in cemeteries, which I believe we can see on the next slide. So um, cemeteries are always a great source of uh, biological refugia as they tend to be uh, undisturbed throughout time given their resting place for the dead. However, that has not so much been the case in San Francisco. Um, the only two cemeteries that still remain in San Francisco are the, uh, the National Cemetery in the Presidio and the Mission Dolores Cemetery. Uh, the other two cemeteries in this slide, as well as all other cemeteries, were moved down to uh, Colma in the 1900s, again, to make way for more housing and uh, urbanization. Um, some common cemetery trees during this time include uh, the Monterey Cypress and the English Yew. Again, um, just sort of relics of a time when San Francisco, uh, the open space San Francisco did have was given to cemeteries, not so much parks, but still nevertheless an example of uh, green space during these times. Um, moving on to the era of parks in San Francisco, um, we begin to see the post gold rush era, which included much of the landed gentry and wealthy uh, setting up shop in San Francisco, um, largely from the East Coast there. And there's a desire uh, to replicate the parks that were found in cities such as New York. Um, this started with the establishment of uh, Reckon Park in 1871 and the development of Golden Gate Park after residents expressed a desire to uh, see a park similar to Central Park, which was a huge success in New York. Um, Golden Gate Park was designed by Frederick Law Olmsted, a urban planner who has planned parks all throughout um, America as well as Central Park in New York and was also designed by uh, William Hammond Hall. Um, however, in regards to vegetation, uh, the major player for that would be John McLaurin, a horticulturalist. Um, he was a huge advocate for parks trying to be as natural as possible. Um, he wanted very dense vegetation and sort of wanted people to connect with nature as much as possible in the park. Um, I found it funny while researching him that he was very opposed to statues in the park. and um, <laughs> exactly, and um, would, would actually uh, plant trees to cover up many statues in the park, um, many of which were uncovered uh, through various uh, vegetation clearing efforts uh, beyond his death, and people didn't know they existed there. So um, definitely an interesting uh, fellow, especially when we talk about statues today, and um, it'd be interesting to see uh, what all he thinks of the Golden Gate Park of today. Um, so this period saw some of the traditional trees that we know San Francisco to have now. 
Um, the three on the right there, the eucalyptus, Monterey pine and Monterey cypress are all the most commonly uh, found tree species in San Francisco. Um, this also, this list includes a host of other species. Again, you can see that these are typically pretty large species, again, sort of going with that desire to have very densely vegetated uh, green spaces. Um, and all those trees are still very common in San Francisco today. Um, some other players in this time include Adolf Sutro. Uh, he was a real estate magnate of sorts and uh, was once mayor of San Francisco. He's known for creating Sutro Heights, uh, Sutro Baths, which uh, burned down, as well as owning Mount Davidson. Um, as you can see, he was a big fan of eucalyptus trees as evidenced by Mount Sutro and Mount Davidson. The photo on the bottom right of Mount Davidson, um, he owned half of that, uh, the other half being owned by Leland Stanford. Um, his half is covered with eucalyptus trees as he loved trees and the barren part on the northeast part of the park, which to this day has no trees, was uh, Leland Stanford's who wanted nothing to do with trees. So it's interesting to see the contrast there in uh, use of public space uh, that uh, is, still remains to this day. Um, another player in the uh, tree planting scene was Mary Ellen Pleasant, a uh, prominent abolitionist and a black businesswoman. She uh, once owned a large tract of land in the Fillmore and Western Edition. It has since been reduced in size, um, but she still has the eucalyptus trees she planted in front of her manor there at the bottom and has the designation of being the smallest park in San Francisco. Um, moving on, you can see that um, basically throughout this period there was a just rapid increase in the amount of uh, species richness and the amount of tree species in San Francisco. It's in stark contrast to the Ohlone period and Spanish-Mexican period in that um, there were a bunch of nurseries at this time, a bunch of Northern European um, immigrants with their uh, background in uh, botanical gardens and nurseries, established uh, shop. The neighborhood of Portola is known as the Rose District to this day, just due to the fact that um, these people brought with them trees from all around the world and rapidly increased the amount of trees, we, tree species we see today in San Francisco. Um, Moving on to the 20th century, we see the 1906 earthquake and subsequent fire, which decimated basically that whole orange area on the bottom left uh, diagram there um, that basically leveled the ground, both clearing uh, historic buildings and much of the existing vegetation. Um, however, much like our flag is the symbol of the phoenix for rebirth through fire, uh, there was a development um, of more street trees through this period. St. Francis Wood was an addition that specifically called for the designation of tree line boulevards. And we also uh, see the Dolores Street median uh, palm trees planted there, largely as a homage to uh, the Catholic tradition that Alex previously mentioned. Um, and let's see, so moving on to more of the middle of the 20th century here, we have the San Francisco Urban Tree Commission report uh, as early back as the 1950s that cited the need for more trees. Um, the burgeoning environmental movement of the 1960s uh, helped create Sydney Walton Park as, along with the desire to increase more public art in public spaces. Um, moving to the late 70s, uh, us here at Friends of the Urban Forest were established in 1981, uh, based out of a group of concerned citizens who uh, were desired to see more street trees and were overall concerned with the lack of trees in San Francisco. Um, again, going with the cycle of destruction and rebirth, the Loma Prieta earthquake saw the development of several more trees, um, largely in the Fillmore Western edition there, with the collapse of the highway that went through there and its uh, subsequent uh, redirection, um, that whole reconstruction period saw uh, an influx of more trees to that neighborhood. And then um, finally in 1997, we get our first urban forest plan 
uh, one of many to come as we continue to advance policies to address the needs of the urban forest. So uh, in regards to our 21st century planning and planting, uh, we have in 2010, the Better Streets Plan, uh, that was largely how to uh, make better, outline a way to make better streets for San Francisco. And it cited uh, trees as a very good option to improve uh, pedestrian safety. Uh, studies show that trees reduce um, the likelihood of people speeding when present in uh, on streets. So that plan called for more trees. In 2013, we had our first uh, census of trees in the area and inventory of all street trees. In 2014, we see the redevelopment of a new urban forest plan. Uh, in it, it called again the need for more trees as well as the need uh, to for the city to take care of them throughout their life cycle as uh, every forest is always a dynamic ecosystem. In 2015, we here at FUF celebrated our planting of our 50,000th tree. Uh, super exciting development here for us. And that was followed by Prop E in 2016, which um, basically reaffirmed trees as public infrastructure. It gave all liability and responsibility of their maintenance uh, to the city, as well as set aside funds for their ongoing maintenance and our tree planting projects. Um, so we're on to a poll now, so I will let Anna take this one away. Uh, so with that and kind of in the planning theme, I'm going to launch this next poll about the estimated canopy cover of San Francisco. So what percent of San Francisco's total land is covered by street trees? We'll give that a little bit of time. And as we do that, we'll see if there's any questions in the chat. There are not, feel free to submit those questions. Um, gonna give about five more seconds on the poll. All right. So Logan, you wanna take away the results? Yeah, so it looks like Good deal of us right in the middle there between uh, 10 and 20%. Um, however, the answer is going to be 13.4%. Um, as you can see on the left here, that's a total tree population of 669,000 and street trees um, at 125,000, about a quarter of account. They account for about a quarter of trees in San Francisco. Um, again, now we have over 500 species in this period. On the right, we can see some of the most common uh, street trees planted. London Plain is the most uh, planted street tree in the world, so it is no surprise that um, it is the most common street tree found here in San Francisco. And then we can also see some of the more common trees that we here plant at Fuff and that you'll see on most city streets. Um, and at the bottom there is sort of a cost uh, value presentation of the ecological values of trees, um, largely in regards to carbon sequestration and air pollution reduction, and uh, basically the economic value assigned to those benefits. Um, so, here we are today with our current number of tree species topping out over 500. So um, going back to the lonely times at 10, we have increased a very good amount um, in a short period of time, uh, the amount of species we have here in San Francisco. So I think it's very interesting to see that just basically over a 300 or so year period that we are now at over 500 species of trees. Um, so what, what, what does that mean in terms of the urban forest going forward? Um, well, in terms of canopy cover, San Francisco actually has a relatively low canopy cover compared to other major uh, US cities. Um, as you can see there, it says uh, at that time of that survey, it said we had 11.9%, uh, um, which is half if not more uh, the amount than other uh, similar sized cities or just other cities in general. So overall to this day, San Francisco remains to have a smaller canopy cover than um, 
other other cities. But um, still, what does that mean going forward? Um, it means that we're here to plant more trees and increase that canopy cover. Um, so Public Works, uh, who is responsible for the maintenance of many street trees, um, has set out an approved tree list um, that includes three sections, the first of which are trees that have been proven to do well in San Francisco. Um, that includes Southern Magnolia, London Plain, and Victorian Box. As you can see, um, those are also comprised of the most commonly planted street trees in San Francisco, since they do so well. Um, section two includes uh, tree species that do well with special consideration. Um, that's largely in regards to where they're planted. Um, certain species don't do too well on the western side of San Francisco, given its sandy soil and um, in, uh, increased wind patterns, um, whereas trees on the east side may do better. Those include uh, the maple, giant maple, little leaf linden, and silver dollar eucalyptus. And uh, section three is experimental trees. Um, as we gain more tree species at our disposal and um, sort of uh, research more what trees do well in urban environments uh, that leaves room for experimentation to see what sort of species uh, we could plant in the future. So that includes uh, Zelkova, the Southern Live Oak, and Bradford Pear. Um, Public Works also oversees tree uh, permits. Um, so permits are required before a tree can be removed or planted as well as it established protections for uh, significant trees, which are defined as uh, having a gr diameter greater of 12 inches or a height of 20 feet or greater, or designated as a uh, landmark tree by the city. So that's sort of our policy of today regarding the urban forest. Um, so in speaking again of the urban forest of today, this is uh, some data that was provided by the U.S. Forest Service in regards to San Francisco's urban, urban forest. It's basically um, comparing the overall DBH, that's diameter at breast height um, of trees in the city. Um, so typical growth patterns, trees with a greater DBH will be an older tree. Of course, it, it's species specific, but that is generally the trend in regards to age and uh, uh, diameter of the trunk. So as you can see here, um, I believe it's over 51% of trees are under six inches in DBH. So uh, one could conclude that San Francisco has very much a young uh, urban forest and that is clearly evidence, um, I think throughout this presentation and our progression of the amount of tree species in the city um, and just sort of the general pattern of urban development, um, disturbances in the form of earthquakes and fire, and um, just sort of the inhospitable, inhospitable nature to plant trees in the city um, has led to, you know, a very young forest, but, you know, one that will uh, grow with time here and one that we can continue to take care of in the future. So um, that will go to our next poll, final poll. Yep, so we're just going to have one last poll. Um, the answer, this is sneaky, this is not the most common street tree, this is the most common tree species in San Francisco. Um, so Monterey pine, Monterey cypress, we'll do about five more seconds on this. All right, get your answers in. And it looks like we've got a tie between London Plain and Blue Gum Eucalyptus. And Logan, the answer is? The answer is the Blue Gum Eucalyptus. It was a bit of a trick question. The London Plain is the most planted street tree. However, the most common tree in San Francisco is the Blue Gum Eucalyptus as it's fast growing and in its historic period was a cheap source of timber. Um, so here we have a nice little uh, pie diagram of these most common species. As you can see, the big three, the blue gum, Monterey pine, Monterey cypress, comprise of about a third of trees as um, then along with some of the more 
common street trees that we plant are found at that other quadrant there. Um, I think the most interesting part of this diagram though, as we discuss the future of the urban forest is the amount of uh, other species that uh, comprise of the urban forest there. It's over 51.4% of uh, tree species are represented in that uh, green section there. So I think as we discuss the future of our urban forest, I think we are in, while we may have a low canopy cover and a relatively young urban forest, um, we're in good shape in terms of species richness and diversity as um, diversity brings resiliency to the urban forest and should hopefully lead to a healthy, more healthy urban forest going forward here. And we're blessed uh, to live in California in a place where uh, several such species can grow. Um, so I think that just about concludes everything. Uh, the, my, I guess my ending note with all this is that um, when we think about land use and uh, place and just forestry in general, that it's a, it's a constant process. Uh, nothing's ever complete. Trees uh, get planted, they grow up, they die, the land changes along with the people with it. And that um, all of this sort of ties into the place we call home and how we interact with it uh, is a constant process. And uh, going forward, um, it will always be our, we will always be connected to the place and it is our responsibility to continue to care for it. Um, I think with that, um, I think we can open it up to any other questions anybody may have. Um, this largely concludes the history here in policy and ecology. Um, so if anybody has any other questions, uh, feel free to chat them or um, yeah, and I'm just going to go ahead and pull up the chat. Um, thank you all so much for coming. It's great to see your names and pictures and faces. We, we truly miss seeing you at planting events and tree care events. Um, let's see. There are a couple of questions about invasive species that Alex seems to have answered in the chat. Um, and let's see. Uh, someone mentioned blackwood acacias. Yeah, those can just take over a whole environment. Um, but with that, if there's any other questions, feel free to let us know or follow up after the presentation. This will be recorded and made available. Uh, so if you would like a copy of that, feel free to contact us or Atalanta and we can send that over to you. Looks like we did have a question about eucalyptus. Um, uh, eucalyptus is considered an invasive species and it is known to uh, destroy uh, many native ecosystems, most notably chaparral ecosystems. Um, however, it's also a fast growing tree that sequesters a lot of the carbon and provides canopy cover. So. Um, it sort of comes down to uh, if you value uh, native ecology and preserving native ecosystems versus sort of accepting, I would say, uh, urbanized environment and the benefits a non-native species can provide. I do know it is definitely a source of controversy to this day, especially in regards to uh, historic sutro sites like Mount Davidson and Sutro Heights, which I think the eucalyptus there are currently posed for removal due to being invasive, but again. Some of them are actually. Event. What's that? Um, some of them are. Mount Sutro has a pretty active management plan where they're, they're working with the community. They're restoring a native meadow at the top and they're removing some of the more hazardous eucalyptus trees, but I believe they plan to keep some of them. Yeah, um, I'll just add much like in the Presidio, one of the main challenges that we see is like human safety with the eucalyptus because um, they were planted and then not really thinned out. So now we have a bunch of, you know, we talk about this in tree care, a bunch of trees that are really struggling. They have a little bit of leaf and a whole bunch of trunk that, that they have to support. So um, that's one of the reasons for thinning. Um, and another recent paper came out that found that the eucalyptus, because it's so sticky, 
is actually the best tree for one of the best trees for cleaning our air and catching like the soot and the stuff off of cars. So, you know, maybe not great for the natural environment, but pretty good for um, our carbon sequestration and lungs. I see another one about trees being fire dependent. Um, and so in California, uh, we have a couple different fire regime ecosystems. Some are like in Sierra Nevada, we have a bunch of trees that are adapted to be resistant to fire. Um, if, the, if you look at the history of the American West, um, looking at like uh, scars on trees, they found that there's usually a fire about every mm, 10 to 25 years in much of the place um, that had to do with um, both lightning strikes and also accidental and intentional burning um, by the traditional people here. So some trees are resistant to that. They have thick bark, they grow very large, and they don't have low canopies. Um, so they live for a very long time. Uh, so examples of that might be like a sugar pine or a ponderosa pine or a Douglas fir. And some species are actually dependent upon those fires um, to repropagate and before, or otherwise they could decline. So species that might grow quickly after that kind of disturbance event because either they need bare soil um, or a lot of light. So something like a ceanothus, um, certain types of manzanitas um, might actually be, they die down to the root burl or oaks will die down to the root burl and then sprout back. Um, or Bailey's acacia actually only lives about 25 years. It's, a, it's from a fire dependent ecosystem in Australia. I think the great answer or the great example of this though is the Monterey pine. Um, Monterey pines come from the coast. They would come from places that instead of having low intensity frequent burns, they would have that were typically set by native people. They would have a high intensity um, catastrophic burn where the entire forest would burn um, on a less frequent basis. And so they actually don't live very long. We planted them about 100 years ago and now they're all getting a disease because they've just reached the end of their life because typically they might only live about 40, 50 years and they actually hold on to their cones covered in resin and they'll open up only when there's enough heat for um, to like indicate to the cones, oh yeah, fire's happening, um, now we're gonna reseed. So they are fire dependent for their um, dispersal as are giant sequoias. All right, we've got another kind of whopper of a question from Mike. Can you talk about the idea of restoration in light of all of these different periods of human habitation and each period's cultural relationships to vegetation? Hmm. <laughs> That's a whole other webinar, but. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. <laughs> um, I mean, I think it's, one of my other forestry professors used to say, it depends on your objective. Um, San Francisco had a bunch of native ecosystems um, that are no longer represented. Um, so, but we also didn't have a million people here in this dense urban environment. Um, so this is a whole like um, restoration dynamics could be a whole nother ecosystem. Things like conserving um, the last of the rarest species, um, conserving the last of the least, looking at these things as pockets, kind of like you would an island biogeography. Um, looking at uh, plant communities that um, they call it last to go, first to sow, meaning the ones that are most resilient to um, urban disturbance can actually set up for, um, like they can restore that ecosystem to a place where the more rare species can come back. Um, and then obviously having to consider, you know, because we have a whole mix of people from all over the world, um, you know, perhaps having a species that is representative of that people's culture and is nostalgic for them will help them be better stewards. Um, I think the key point that I have, that one of my restoration ecology colleagues has said um, is that, yes, we have an overpopulation problem, but really it's kind of a cultural problem. If we all were able to prioritize some hands on the land stewardship, all of a sudden we would have millions of people to deal with the most invasive species and um, also plant the most uh, ecologically relevant, particularly as the climate changes. Um, so figuring out 
an ecosystem that gets them involved first and foremost is for me the priority in urban forestry um, so that they have a connection here um, that they can spread to the rest of the ecosystem around them but that's just my opinion do anna logan you want to take anything on from there I, I agree with most of what you said there and yeah i think it yeah it definitely comes down to priorities and um sort of sort of what what place means for many different people and um for some that can be replicating what was once historic ecologically and in other times it's accepting that um you know change change is constant as it is so um sort of how can we best adapt to uh, future problems through the natural solutions we have. And I do think this is a, a neat place to shout out to our sidewalk landscaping program because they can bring in a lot of other native species that Fuff can't plant because they're, you know, our, sorry, that tree planting can't plant. <laughs> I'm on the tree planting team. I have. Uh, blinders on sometimes, but sidewalk landscaping has the opportunity to put in a lot more native species that support pollinators in the native ecosystem. And, um, you know, SFMTA did have, I don't know if they're doing it so much anymore, but they have um, like their greenways and kind of wildlife corridors that they're prioritizing. So that's, you know, the, another way to balance both our human needs with the needs of the like both rare and native and not rare um, animals be able to migrate through our city in their historical flyways. This is a really great discussion. I had, there was another question up top from David Duckworth um, asking about if there are plans for educating the general public about tree canopy. kind of my realm we have tree tours talking about that that's more about identification um, diversity and stuff like that um, as far as the general public goes that was a big push in prop e as well um, or the the better what is it safer healthy trees safer sidewalks initiative um, is looking at that um, you know comparing us to other cities and you know i think as more data comes out um, particularly looking at the disparities in canopy and the health um, implications for that, both psychological and physical, things like scrubbing of the air or um, like lower stress levels um, and cortisol levels. I think we will have, once again, another push for urban forest equity in our canopy distribution. And that's kind of what we are doing right now at FUF is trying to um, increase equitable access to all of those benefits um, so that they are anyone could have access to the street trees, no matter what neighborhood they live in. These are all really great questions. Um, keep them coming if you want. You're welcome to stay on and chat for a little bit. I think, I think that's it from the chat as far as we've got, and that's, we're at 5.02 right now. That's just a time check. see anything else all right well thank you guys so much for attending like like we said it means a lot to see your names see your faces stay involved with fuff during this remote time um, and we'll be fine for the recording you can expect to hear from Atalanta on that and if you have any other questions, think of something tonight, you know, you're just thinking over this presentation and you can't remember something, feel free to reach out and we'd be more than happy to continue that. All right, with that, I think we're going to end the meeting. It was great to see you all.